first-year university students, and Bill, who works for the Student Union Employment Service. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now, let's begin. Answer the questions as you listen. You will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions 1 to 5. Hi Bill, this is my friend Charlotte. She's doing first year science too. Pleased to meet you Charlotte. Annetta told me you want some part-time work. Now. I just have to complete your details on the computer. Um, what's your surname? Johnston. With an E? Yes. J-O-H-N-S-T-O-N-E. I know that you live in the Heathfield Street student residence, but I can't remember the street number there. It's 126. 126. Good. And the phone number? Well, actually, I never give people that number because sometimes nobody answers or they forget to pass on the messages. So, I bought a mobile phone yesterday, but I can't remember the number. I think it's 0414847748. I'll just check. No, sorry, not 748. It's 749. 0414847749? Yes, that's right. I must try and remember it. And what sort of work are you looking for? Well, anything really, I suppose, though it depends when it is. I'd rather work during the day, if that's possible. How many hours a week were you thinking of? Oh, I'm not sure. Maybe about ten. But I need to keep at least two days a week free for study. Do you have any work experience? Not much, though I used to help in my uncle's shop when I was at school. OK. Well, I'll put it in, but we don't usually get shop work. What about gardening? I'd rather not. Everything I touch dies. What other kinds of work are there? Well, there's a, a lot of demand for house cleaning, fast food preparation and kitchen work and pizza delivery if you've held a driving licence for 12 months. I'm not sure. Can I have a look at the vacancies while you talk to Annetta? Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Bill, I'd like to change my job. You're at the Hamburger Express on the High Street, aren't you? What's the problem? Well, I never know what hours I'm going to work. I start at 7pm and I'm supposed to finish at 11pm, but sometimes they keep me until 2 or 3am. Yes, that is a bit late if you have to make a 9am lecture the next day. And the other thing is the pay. They're supposed to pay me on Thursdays, but they never pay me on the correct day, often not until Friday or Saturday. A few weeks ago, I had to wait until Sunday. They said their son was sick so they couldn't get to the bank. But they're always making excuses. Yes, that doesn't sound too good. Would you be interested in pizza delivery? You need to have a driving licence. Yes, I've got a licence. But I think I'd like to change from working in the evening. Are there any day jobs available? 
Well, as I told Charlotte, there are several cleaning and gardening vacancies. Uh, and this childcare job that just came in this morning. Do you like children? Yes, I do, actually. What's the job? Let's have a look. Collect the boy aged four from kindergarten at 3 p.m. Pick up the other two girls who are aged six and nine from the primary school at 3.15. You take them home and look after them. The parents will be home by seven. That sounds quite good. What about the pay? It's the same as you're earning now. Four hours a day, Monday to Friday, so 20 hours a week. You need to contact Mrs uh, Alicia Thompson. Her phone number is 91045629 and she lives in Springfield. I've never been to Springfield. I hope I don't get lost. Don't worry. It sounds quite straightforward. Let's have a look at the street directory. The Thompsons live here in Tulip Street, number 252. So you catch the 631 bus, get off here next to the post office in Daisy Terrace. Walk past the post office to the corner and on the opposite corner is the kindergarten. Then walk down Daffodil Place and cross over to the primary school. Then keep going down Daffodil Place to the corner and turn right into Tulip Street. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear a guide named Matt who is introducing their trip in Wildlife Haven. Now you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen to the first part of the introduction carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Well, good morning, everybody. My name's Matt, and I'm one of the three guides here at Wildlife Haven. Our job is to make sure that you all have a great time here with us and go home feeling happy and relaxed. As you can see, we're away from the city in a remote area between a national park and the sea. To encourage you to relax, there are no radios or TVs, and the only phones and newspapers are in the office. So, if peace and quiet is what you've come for, this is the place to be. From your cabin on the hill, you'll find you have the National Park behind you, and you can look out from the sea from your front balcony. Your luggage will be unloaded from the bus and taken to your rooms in a few minutes. Once you have picked up your key at reception, please locate your room and check that all your luggage has arrived. The daily program here at Wildlife Haven is flexible and only as demanding as you want it to be. You should each have a brochure setting out the facilities and various walking tracks you can take. And on the bus, you are given a green sheet setting out a number of group tours in the coming week. If you want to join any tour, just write your name and room number on the relevant sheet along the wall here. Tomorrow, there is a Beachcombers and Rockhoppers tour exploring marine life in the rock pools along the beach. Or, if you'd prefer to go inland, there's a guided forest walk that takes you off the walking tracks. If you want to catch some lunch, you could join the beach fishing expedition. And at night, you'll see there is a moonlight forest walk that leaves each night at 7 p.m. So there is plenty to choose from at Wildlife Haven, and of course, that includes just sitting on your balcony watching the waves roll in but I would recommend my favorite tour, the Waterfall Walk. 
This departs at sundown each day and also provides the opportunity to have a moonlight swim. Now you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. In the second part of the introduction, you are going to get some advice from Matt. Listen carefully and answer questions 16 to 20. You've chosen to visit us in January, which is one of our hotter months. And although you may be tempted to wear a minimum of clothing, you should always take precautions against injury, particularly in the National Park. This includes sensible footwear. You'd be surprised how many of our guests ignore this advice and end up being sorry. And socks are a good idea too. And even though you might be under trees a lot of the time, it's a good idea to wear a hat in this hot climate. There's no need to be too concerned about walking in the National Park, provided you use common sense. It's true that there are poisonous spiders in the park, but they are really more frightened of you than you are likely to be of them. I should also warn you against eating any wild berries. Some are edible, but you should avoid them all. We'll provide all the food you can eat. Well, that's about all for now. Dinner is from 6 to 8 p.m. in this building. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You'll hear a tutor and a student talking about the history of the scientific method. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hello, Simon. Come in. Take a seat. Now, I wanted to talk to you about your assignment. Yes, the one on the scientific method. That's right. I just wanted to see how you were getting on. Well, I think it's fine. I mean, I haven't done a huge amount of work on it because I've been working on other things. But what I've read so far seems fine. How many of the references that I gave you have you managed to get hold of? Not too many, I'm afraid. It seems that everyone else is working on the same things at the same time. And every time I look, the books are checked out from the library. Right. Well, I think that we can go over the main ground together now. That way, even if you don't manage to go through all the references in detail, you'll still have an overview. What has helped you most so far? I've managed to have a look at three of them. I thought that Johnson made some good points, but it was hard to follow the line of her argument. Bradman was simple and straightforward, and I felt as if I got a lot out of that. I wish I could say the same for Whitaker. To be honest, I didn't get very far with that. OK, that's more or less what I'd expect. So tell me, what have you learned so far about the role of the Egyptians and the Babylonians? Yes. Well, there's evidence that the basic components of the scientific method, examination, diagnosis, treatment, and prognosis, 
were being used in the early 1600s BC, especially in the treatment of certain illness. Good. Yes, that's right. And the point, of course, is that that represented a considerable advance over relatively simple, non empirical approaches, which usually attributed anything unknown to the actions of the gods, etc. Of course, the Egyptians and Babylonians did this as well, but what we see emerging here is a willingness to base opinion on systematic study of the real world, which is at the root of the scientific method. I see. Right, yes. And then that reappears later. Yes, although don't get carried away with the idea that it was a simple process of development. By the time we get to ancient Greece, let's take the period towards the middle of the 5th century BC, the rules governing the scientific method were practiced on a widespread scale, but there were still many people who believed that real truth could only be acquired by pure rational thought. Plato, of course, had a great influence on the development of the scientific method during this period. Through his academy. That's right. But then, as we know, a great deal of understanding of the scientific method disappeared as the old world order collapsed. It wasn't until the Middle Ages, sometime before the 11th century, that several versions of the scientific method emerged from the medieval Muslim world, all of which stressed the importance of experimentation in science. Right. I think I've got the historical timeline. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. The other thing I'm struggling with slightly is actually pinning down precisely what we mean by the scientific method. I wonder if you could give me some pointers on that. Sure. Well, it's best to think of the scientific method as a series of steps in a process which allows us to find answers to questions about the world around us. So the first step is to identify the problem. What is it that you want to know or explain? And then I think the next step is designing an experiment. Hmm. But you can't design an experiment unless you know what you want your experiment to tell you. Oh, yes. You need to form a hypothesis to be tested before you design the experiment. So, there's a very clear relationship between hypothesis and experiment. Having designed the experiment, then of course you go on to carry out the experiment. The particular procedure you follow, the protocol, will differ from experiment to experiment, but the underlying principle is the same. You analyze the data from the experiment in order to confirm or disprove your hypothesis. Assuming the experiment is accurate. Oh, yes. If there's anything unusual about the data, or if the results are at all surprising, then you need to ask yourself whether the experiment could be flawed and whether the data could be unreliable. If the answer is yes, then it may be necessary to modify the experiment and go through the process again. So, once you have reliable, valid results, then the final step is to communicate them. The wider scientific community needs to know about the results, and publication in journals is the accepted way. OK. I think I've got the basics. It's going to get more complicated as we begin to look at some people who have criticized the scientific method. So you need to make sure that you understand things up to this point. Let me know if you have any further problems with it. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part four. Part four. In this section, you'll hear a lecture on coral reef. First, you have some time to read questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully to the lecture and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Do you fancy diving in the wonderful world of coral reefs, green sponges, colourful fish, and red crabs? It is a rich garden beneath the waves. But how much do you know about the corals? Are they animals or plants? What are the threats to coral reefs? Today, Mr. Tim Harford, executive director of the Coral Reef Alliance. Is going to introduce the facts about coral reefs. Good afternoon, everyone. Coral reefs are one of nature's most magnificent creations. It is filled with thousands of unique and valuable plants and animals. Over one quarter of all marine species depend on healthy coral reefs. Humans also depend on coral reefs. These marine ecosystems are the primary source of food and income for millions of people. A vast repository of valuable chemical compounds and medicines, and a natural wave barrier that protects beaches and coastlines from waves and storms. Coral is actually the exoskeletons of coral polyps, made from limestone. These skeletons build up over time, forming the reef. New corals are born each April. At a certain hour on a certain night. Mature corals suddenly release clouds of eggs and sperm into the sea. After the fertilized eggs take root on the sea floor, they can grow up to fifteen centimeters per year. Coral reefs are present in the waters of over one hundred countries. These are warm, eighteen to twenty-nine degrees centigrade, shallow, sunny regions, primarily between the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn. Only clear, warm salt water can support a coral reef, and because sunlight is crucial to the reef's survival, the water must also be shallow. The algae that grow on coral provide much of the coral's food. In deeper water, algae cannot get the sunlight they need to grow. Most coral reefs are in the tropics because natural conditions there are perfect. In their modern form. Coral reefs have thrived on Earth for over fifty million years. In recent years, however, more than eleven percent of the world's reefs have been lost, with another sixteen percent severely damaged during the El Nino event in 1998. Up to thirty-two percent of coral reefs may be destroyed by human activities in the next thirty years if we do not take action now. Corals and coral reefs are extremely sensitive. Slight changes in the reef environment may have detrimental effects on the health of entire coral colonies. These changes may be due to a variety of factors. One of the greatest threats to coral reefs is human expansion or development. As human population increases, so does the harvest of resources from the sea. Due to overfishing, reef fish populations have been greatly decreased in some areas of the world. The removal of large numbers of reef fish has caused the coral reef ecosystems to become unbalanced. As we know, corals are also very popular as decorations. A large amount of the most healthy corals are selected by commercial collectors. They sell the corals to souvenir shops, where a large number of tourists wait to purchase them as decorations or souvenirs. Coral reefs also receive much damage from both commercial and private vessels. The leakage of fuels into the water and the occurrence of spills by large tankers are extremely damaging to local corals. Although much of the coral reef degradation is directly blamed on human impact, there are several natural disturbances which cause significant damage to coral reefs. The most recognized of these events are hurricanes or typhoons. Which bring powerful waves to the tropics. 
These storm waves cause large corals to break apart and scatter fragments about the reefs. Home to a diverse community of creatures, coral reefs are underwater treasure chests of colour and activity. Predators and prey swim and crawl among the coral in nature's never-ending dance of life and death. This lively, fascinating world beneath the waves is just waiting to be explored. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.